questions in a moment. Hi, I can see you, Maru, waving. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to meet people virtually <laughs> when we've been exchanging emails. So, yeah, it's nice. And I can see some of our students. I can see Michaela. Hi. <laughs> and there's uh, Joe. Dean, one of my colleagues from UCL, just arriving. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just keep people a few more minutes uh, to trail on into the room. <laughs> Should probably play some music or something in the background. People are arriving. <laughs> Maybe on African music. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> I got my Malian cloth behind me. Mm. Okay, I, I want I wanted to ask you about it. Is, is that a gift? No, actually, I went to Mali quite a long time ago as a tourist, oh. and um, oh. I bought some of the cloth. So I have a couple of pieces. Yeah. Okay. It's nice. Cheers up my office. <laughs> okay. Well, you're an African African lover. So you love Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I am a bit of a fan. I don't go very much anymore though. Mm. I haven't been since uh yeah. Have you ever actually been? no, I was there last year, just before the crisis. I was in uh, Ghana mm. for a few days. Have you ever been in Cameroon? No, I've never been to Cameroon. Oh, that's unfortunate. So I'm just waiting for my invitation. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> the best place, the best place ever in Africa. <laughs> so there we go. I'll wait for my invitation. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's good. Okay. Still got quite a few more. I never know whether the signing up number is going to bear any relationship to what happens in reality, but we'll just wait another couple of minutes. So. If there are people coming in, if you I think pretty much everyone has muted themselves, but if anyone hasn't, if you could just do that. Okay, I think we'll we'll start with the introductions at least. So before I do anything else, I'm I'm going to be recording this lecture with Carlos's kind permission. Uh, there were quite a lot of people who wanted to come but weren't able to make it. So I'm just going to start recording now. Cette conversation va être enregistrée. Okay, so um, a warm welcome to everyone to tonight's event. Um, this is, um, well, 
not our first lecture, but the first one that we at UCL are hosting in the uh, UCL SOAS Global Translation Lecture Series of 2020-2021. Uh, this is a series that's been running for a few years. Um, and we invite scholars from around the world according to our budget. Now this year, in a way, we're lucky because um, it's a lot easier to bring people here virtually um, <laughs> than to bring them to London uh, in person. So we've been able to be quite ambitious this year and we've invited people from five different continents. And I'm extremely grateful to all our speakers for going along with this um, slightly, slightly crazy idea. Um, and it's our pleasure this year uh, to welcome two speakers from the relatively recently formed Cameroon Association for Translation Studies uh, with the acronym ACTRA. Um, so it was founded in 2018 and celebrated the inaugural issue of its translational journal Critic uh, in 2020. And so we have two speakers from ACTRA this year and the first is tonight. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Carlos Diomu Tioku, who is currently at um, ICIT in Paris, um, the uh, Interpreting and Translation uh, Specialist School uh, in Paris. Um, Carlos is a, a PhD researcher there in translation studies um, under the supervision of um, Professor Isabel Colomba. And he's researching principles, practices, methods, and resources that can help translators become entrepreneurs or better entrepreneurs and helping them to transition from what he calls content mediators into business owners uh, with both a value and an impact. Um, so he's interested in all the things that go with that, uh, including new media, digital tools, um, ergonomics in translation. So I think this is a, a fascinating topic and I'm really delighted that Carlos has agreed to speak this evening. Uh, thank him for agreeing to speak in English, uh, which makes things a little simpler for us uh, to host. Um, so thank you for that, um, that extra effort there on your part. Um, we'll have um, Carlos's talk for roughly 40 minutes and then we'll have the remaining time, so about 15 or 20 minutes for your questions. You're welcome to post questions in the chat if you want, um, or we can, as we're quite a small audience tonight, we can also just ask them by turning our microphones on at the end. Um, so I will uh, hand over to Carlos. Before I do that, let me just check there's no one sitting in the waiting room. Oh, hang on a minute. There are two people sitting in the waiting room. Let me just let them in <laughs> before you start, Carlos. You. Um, so welcome. Uh, just wait for them to connect. So welcome to the two that I've just let in and we're just about to start. So you're just in time. Uh, all right, uh, Carlos, that's over to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, on my, on my, thank you very much for joining this event. I'm really pleased to be to be here tonight with you. And on behalf of the ACTRA, and I see that Umaru Marmazu, the president, the current president of the association, is also taking part in this event. And I wish to thank him for providing me with this opportunity of speaking on behalf of the association. So thank you very much. Let's let's get started, please. I'll share my screen and I've got the PowerPoint presentation. Just to be, make sure we are all on the safe side. Can everyone can you see the presentation? Yes, that's that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. I guess everyone also also is, has access to it. So um, tonight's presentation has, is titled Translators as Entrepreneurs in Africa. And as Catherine said, I'm interested in anything that is related to translation, entrepreneurship and Africa as a whole, because I myself, am, I come from Africa. So let's get started, please. Um, first of all, it's important to start this topic, this talk with paying attention to the perspective we use whenever we are looking or thinking about Africa. And many people have been thinking about Africa as the continent that is, that is left behind. This is because there's, there are some realities, but the realities are looked at from a very pessimistic point of view. So most of the time in the mainstream media, Africa is described as the continent 
of migration, famine, political unrest, corruption, misery, illiteracy, and so many ills that make people think maybe Africans are not normal human beings, not standard human beings. And most of the time they have um, all kinds of preconceptions about Africa. But on the other hand, some other people may see Africa from an optimistic point of view, from an optimistic perspective. That is, it's an Africa, a continent that is mobility friendly, that is um, actually um, making sure that all uh, the economies are being emerging. It's also a continent about growing innovation, a young workforce, and then cultural richness. Catherine, you, you told me about your trip to Mali, and then you, you must have realized the richness of the cultural, um, cultural aspects of Africa. And then there's also innovation. So depending on the way you look at Africa, you may believe Africa is maybe just a poor continent or a continent that has already been baking about um, public development heard from all the IMF, the World Bank, but I can assure you that actually there is more to Africa than all the poor negative image that the mainstream media have been showing. So I'll make sure that I, I deal with some of those aspects during this, this presentation. So there are some facts that are also worth nothing. So apart from the negative perception that people may have, these are the facts. First, I focus on three. The first one is population. So up to now, according to the statistic, the current statistic from the World Economic Forum, Africa's population is made up of 75% of people aged less than 35 years old. So just think about it. It means the, the vast majority of the African population is made up of young people. And this is something really positive to think about. The second fact is that Africa is a business friendly continent because according still to the World Economic Forum, there is a 5.6 trillion um, um, dollar, US dollars in business opportunities that are being provided by Africa depending on the different specific, the different areas that we may be focusing on. So that means actually, uh, contrary to what has been, what has been showed about Africa, what has been told about Africa, there's still uh, so many opportunities, so many business opportunities to be seized in Africa. And then the third part about Africa is the linguistic diversity. So right now, Africa is home to over 2,000 languages. That means Africa has one third of the world's languages. And these statistics are coming from the language magazine. So combining the young population, the business friendliness with the language diversities, you start to believe that actually there's so many things to be, so many positive things to be, to be, to be gained from Africa. And especially because we are translators or because I'm a translator and this uh, presentation has to do with translation and entrepreneurship. We start to see what are the remaining opportunities that we can gain from Africa. Now, since we are talking about entrepreneurship, it seems quite interesting to start by defining entrepreneurship. I know we are translators or we are translation scholars, so we may not be we may not be used to getting access to terms that are not per se. Um, depending on translation studies, but it's quite interesting. So there are so many, so many um, definitions of trans entrepreneurships. Um, the two main, the two main definitions or the two main school of thought that I I notice is the first one is about entrepreneurship as a way to reach targets, and this is illustrated by Carlos and Brinback, who said. Any intelligent person with an achievement and goal orientation is capable of being entrepreneurial. But they said, but and this is very important. But being entrepreneurial needs not result in the actual creation of a firm. So this is the first approach to entrepreneurship. Just making sure that we set specific goals, we take all the necessary measures, and then we reach those goals. The second school of thought defines entrepreneurship 
about um, creating companies, starting businesses, running businesses and all. The, and this is the most common perception about entrepreneurship. Whenever people think about entrepreneurs, they see people who have created um, successful businesses, who are um, successful in business doing, and then who are running their own businesses. And this is also what Westhead and Wright said. Entrepreneurs can be vital agents of innovative change, whose actions lead to the creation of new firms. They can also transform existing firms to exploit economic and socially beneficial opportunities. And remember, we told, I told you about the various opportunities that we can seize in Africa. So this is interesting because there are two main different school of thought and those school of thought focus on various areas, different areas, different approaches. Now, it, a small question break. We, I told you about Africa. I told you about business opportunities. I define entrepreneurship. Now, one single question. Are translators entrepreneurs? Can translators be, be considered as being entrepreneurs? This is quite interesting because I, I started wondering about the relationship between translation and entrepreneurship. And this is the main reason why I enrolled in a PhD student at EZIT, where I've been, run, I've been carrying out a, a PhD research on translation and entrepreneurship. And then my main goal was how to bridge translation and entrepreneurship. And you can see that most of the time translation is defined or translators are defined as being people who are bilingual, who are aware of the cultural differences and who can also play a key role as cultural mediators, who also masters language technologies and have one or more specializations and abide by their professional ethics. This is what translators do and what can define translators on one hand. But on the other hand, what defines entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs can be defined by the, the, strategy, the way they get involved into strategic thinking and planning, how they run their small businesses, how they get involved into social media marketing, public speaking outreach, and then financial, financial management. And from what you can see, it seems as if normal, normal or standard translations, it's kind of different from normal on general entrepreneurship. But by bridging translation and entrepreneurship, I've come up with a, a term of transpreneurs, that is translators working as entrepreneurs or translators making the concrete switch from standard translators into translators who run their businesses and then who take the businesses to the next level. And you see throughout this presentation that being a translator is one thing, but being a transpreneur or acting like a real entrepreneur is something else because there are so many things that are linked with running an actual business and then getting involved in strategic thinking and planning. And later on, we'll have a case study to illustrate all of this. So are translators lost in business? You know the expressions being lost in translations, but we can also wonder whether translators are lost in business. So defining transpreneurs means starting from general entrepreneurship and then moving by making the, the main distinction between entrepreneurs and then entrepreneurs. You remember I told you about the two different school of thoughts whereby the first one was dealing with reaching specific goals where the second school was focusing on um, starting, running, and transforming existing businesses. So from general entrepreneurship, the main distinction we can make is um, um, making a distinction between entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, and then entrepreneurs. Intrapreneurs are those people who may be applying entrepreneurship principles, but within the framework of a company where they are working into, that is, in-house translators can be entrepreneurs, but freelance translators are meant to be entrepreneurs. I specify I'm meant to be, but not all freelance translators will be acting like entrepreneurs. 
And then now from entrepreneurship, we have entrepreneurs and then entrepreneurs. And then from entrepreneurs, we have micro, small and medium enterprises. And then we have also have larger businesses like corporations and so on. But since my focus here is on one man or one person or one translator of businesses, that's the reason why I made sure that actually the transpreneurs fit within the framework of um, micro enterprise, micro enterprises. So um, let us now take a look at entrepreneurs in Africa or transpreneurs in Africa. Whenever people work as transpreneurs in Africa, they are um, faced with several business models, but among all those business models, there are three that most transpreneurs have been using from my own observation. The first one is providing translation services through third parties. These include larger language service providers, translation uh, platforms like Prose.com or Translators Cafe, or even generic freelancer sites like Fever or Freelancer.com. And at times they may provide their services by subcontracting to senior or junior colleagues. This is the first business model that transpreneurs have been using in Africa. Then the second business model is all about providing translation services to direct clients. If you compare as comp with the first one, you realize that actually in the first business model, translators provide their services through third parties who are intermediaries. But in the second uh, business model, they provide the services directly to the clients who will be using those services. And these include local NGOs, international government organizations, community programs, state-owned or private companies, and multinationals. So those are the two main uh, business models. Then there's a third one that is also quite interesting. And it's all about providing translation services via hybrid methods. These hybrid methods could be setting up boutique translation agencies. This is all about one or two, two, trans, two or more translators joining into their forces into getting into a partnership in order to provide services, complementary services. For instance, I'm a French translator, so I tr basically translate from English into French. But if most of the time people have been asking me if I can translate into Spanish or into German, but since those are language pairs that I can offer, I'm a partner with a colleague of mine who've been offering, who's been offering those language pairs so that at least in our joint business, we will be expanding out the scope of our business by providing more and more language pairs. Then there are also complement other type of complementary partnerships. That is, translators can join their forces with um, graphic designer, website designer, or even marketing um, specialists, so that whenever they set a joint business, they can provide translation services, and then they can provide other specialist services like branding, marketing, marketing research, and so on and so forth. Then um, those hybrid methods could also take the form of all-in-one solution offers, whereby a translator can meet with a graphic designer and then they can also call in um, a website designer, a game localizer, and then so they will be providing a, an all, a, a comprehensive serv service to, to clients. So at least whenever the clients enter their businesses and then they require for some service, they will make sure that actually those services, they, they, um, they, they, are re they receive those services, including translation, graphic design, marketing research, game localization, website localization, and so on and so forth. So now there are many challenges that entrepreneurs face in Africa. And those challenges are categorized into three, three areas. The first one, the first category is micro level challenges. Micro level challenges include perceptions that people have about translations. And for most people who have been translating in Africa, and especially those translating into European languages, they are um, perceived like 
second second hand translators because people think people african translators may not master english french spanish or german the way native speakers in quotes master it master those languages in france uh, the uk or in germany so those are the perceptions that um, are very, uh, negative perceptions that are quite um, difficult obstacles that entrepreneurs in Africa should overcome. And then there are also negative biases that are linked to the nat their nativeness or their non-nativeness. There's also the global state of the language industry that can be considered as a main challenge for people in Africa. Um, considering the fact that there's a rising demand in machine translation procedure and the various changes that have been brought in by the, numer the digitalizations of the translation industry. So these were micro level challenges. Then there are also other different challenges that would be faced at the meso level. These include the state of the national economy. So people translating from Africa would be bound to to, to, to the challenges, to the difficulties that are brought in by the state of the national, the national economy. As far as um, the, the, the rates are concerned, as far as the, the exchange rates are concerned. So there are so many things that the national economy would have as impacts, as incidents on the way they do their businesses in Africa. Then there's also power supply and connectivity. For people living outside of Africa, they may take power supply and fast internet connectivity as granted, but it's not as obvious as uh, they, may, they may think because in Africa from time to time, depending on several factors, there might be some issues with power supply and internet connectivity. Then there's also how the local market is regulated or non-regulated. Non there are also some challenges linked with formal training and then the financial viabilities of those um, entrepreneurs in Africa. Because as small businesses, most of the time, they have to fund the activities from their pockets. And if uh, they have to, 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 be, to be bound to the, to the uh, feast and famine cycle, then from time to time, they may not have enough resources to fund their businesses. Whenever they don't have um, a, a constant stream of projects coming in from clients. So financial viability is also one of the main challenges that could be found at the meso level. Then last but not the least, there are also challenges that could be found at the micro level or personal level. These include the personal mindset that the translator may have. So depending on whether they have been, they have gone under formal training or informal training, and even when they have been trained in the same school, they might not have the same mindset, they might not have the same resilience to impact to, to, to difficulties, to financial issues, they might not have the same resilience to the unpredictability of the, 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 the stream of works. So there are also family pressures that um, entrepreneurs in Africa have to undergo because um, most of the time in Africa, uh, a single person may work and then have to cope from to have to deal with or to look after so many other peoples in the, the same household. This may include his parents, his, his, his brothers and sisters, younger brothers and sisters. So from time to time, um, they may be calling the transpreneurs to ask about um, a few things. To, so th this pressure from the family is also a, 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 a huge challenge for those transpreneurs. And then there are also the skill set and the, the professional development, gender inequality, and uncertainty linked with um, the state of translation in Africa. As far as gender inequality is concerned, uh, you might have heard about um, the way um, women, the place that women have in Africa. Um, one thing that struck me is the fact that I've noticed in the Western world, there seems to be more and more more female um, that are translators than male. But it is quite contrasting because in Africa, from my own personal experience, it seems as if I've noticed 
um, the number of male is more is superior is greater than the number of female that are working as trans, trans, translators. So there might be several reasons, several reasons that are, that um, explain this situation. But there there needs to be further research in order to understand the link uh, about gender inequality, gender equality, and the distribution, the gender distribution among translators in Africa. So. These were the main challenges. Now let us just get a case study in order to, to practically study the various difficulties, the various challenges, and then the opportunities that transpreneurs may have in Africa. So this is Musa. Musa A. It's a 29-year male. He lives in, in a sub-Saharan city. He holds a master's degree in translation and then it's been getting, it's been receiving a revenue, a, an average revenue from its um, translation activity, translation business. He's a part of a three year daughter and is in a complicated relationship. So uh, just to be on the safe side and then to avoid any legal action, this is a disclaimer. So this is based on fiction. So. I don't, I don't expect anyone to, to say I've been talking about him. So uh, it's just a, a, a fiction. But this, this fiction is interesting because it will help us go through the main difficulties and then review a few factors that is that would help us get a, a better preview of what um, transpreneurs go through in Africa. So, um, I told you about bridging translation and entrepreneurship. And when I was talking about entrepreneurship, I mentioned the fact that there's the, the importance, I mentioned the importance of strategic planning and strategic thinking. So uh, all normal or standard, in quotes, entrepreneurs know about strategic planning. And one of the main tools that is used to, to, to plan strategically, it's what they call the business model canvas. And I placed a link at the, at the bottom of this. So in case you're interested, you can check online what the business model canvas is all about. So it's quite an interesting, interesting tool because, because it helps in, it, an, an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur to get an overview of the business that is running or that is planning to start. So um, I've, I, I chose a, a, a sample business model canvas that is colored because it's easier for people listening to me to, to, to realize what are the differences between the main sections. So the sections in, in, in green are all about internal factors. So factors that are inherent to the business while the orange categories are external factors. And then the yellow categories are financial related factors. So let us go through some of these factors. Key partners, as entrepreneurs in the, the framework of translations, translators in Africa have as key partners, both their colleagues and then the satisfied clients. And we all know that without clients, there's no possible, there is no business possible. So normally, um, transpreneurs like other entrepreneurs, they do their business and then make sure that actually they take the necessary steps to, to ensure they, um, they provide their clients with satisfactory services and solutions. So whenever those clients are satisfied, and then they can, they can help them gain more and more opportunities by providing many um, uh, translation projects to those entrepreneurs. And then colleagues are also key partners because um, translators are supposed to edify each other to edify one another. And since it says quite quite solitary activity, so translators are also rely on their their colleagues from time to time to, to, to get some assistance about terminology research, about business tools, about um, cut tools, and machine translation, or on different other areas. So key activities of Musa as a transpreneur, Musa A would be dealing mainly with translation, editing, business intelligence, marketing, accounting, 
and babysitting. Remember, it's the father of a, a, a young a young daughter, a young girl. So key resources include the internet connection, the power supply, a tools, a, 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 a laptop or any computer, as a matter of fact, but a laptop is preferred because in case there are some power supply, so you better have some battery at least to save the work you've been doing. Um, and there's also a couple of CVs and then cover letters that is that, that may prove useful in prospecting potential clients. Then there's a contact, there's a network contact. Um, so these are internal factors that Musa will take we pay attention to in order to make sure that the business is up and running and its business is on the on, on, on the right side, on the right track, sorry. So as far as those external factors are concerned, there's value, there's a value proposition that includes translation expertise. So what makes Musa as a transpreneur different from other translators that a potential client may get in touch with? It may advertise its services by focusing on either the translation expertise, the lower rates it may provide, the flexible schedules or the long-term partnership it may, it may enter into with the potential clients. So these may be the factors that Musa will take into consideration in order to define what they call the, 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 the competitive age of its own business. Then the customer relationships are all about making sure that the necessary steps are taken in order to provide, in order to ensure there is, a, is constant email prospection of potential clients. Because all the time, as I said, Musa is the only person in his own business. So he's running a one person business. Remember as key activities, apart from translating, editing, he's also supposed to carry out some business intelligence um, activities. So. Prospecting clients would be part of the, the jobs that job, the duties that will be, it will be uh, come, um, doing in, in its own business. But whenever it's, it, it carry out prospection activities and then it start getting more and more clients, then Musa would make sure that those clients stay uh, loyal to its own business. So it will be providing them with bonuses, discounts, end of year, end of year cards by sending a few kind words like stay safe during this COVID-19 pandemic and so on and so forth. So just to make sure that actually it, it, it bring in the human, a human touch to its own business. And then this would make sure that the business has a kind of competitive edge because the client will compare with other providers and then see there's a difference between Musa A and other, other um, business providers. Then customer segments, uh, the business will mainly focus on mid to large transition companies, multinational, national or international NGOs, mainly based in North America, Western Europe, and Africa. I'm sorry about those people from Asia, but it's just a, a, an example. So uh, using this tool, you may decide that actually you may focus on your, your own business activities on a specific continent, depending on the objective and goals that you want to reach. So there's nothing about discrimination here. Um, now, um, the channels that will be, uh, Musa will be focusing on, whole emails, translators, um, platforms, and social media. Remember, he's also supposed to be doing some marketing prospection and all those things. And then my, uh, social media will be helpful, uh, helpful in, in spreading the word about the services, about his expertise and all the things he can provide um, potential clients with. So the cost structures, the main costs that will be related to running, starting and running Musa's business include insurances and taxes, and software and hardware acquisition, internet connectivity, professional membership, and then capacity building. That is joining events, um, attending conferences, and um, attending seminars or webinars and so on. Now, as far as revenue streams, where, where would Musa's revenues come from? So you focus on three main revenue streams. The first one would be the premium approach, that is providing free samples of his own works so that clients may get a preview of what 
Musa is capable of in order to in order to to, to get more interested and then possibly start a business with Musa. Then there are also training training opportunities that Musa as a transpreneur may provide either to fellow translators or to even business businesses who want to maybe to to, to reach a wider audience a wider audiences or to to start their activities in different market segments in the world. So apart from providing the translation services, he can also provide some trainings. And if it's inspired enough, he can write, self-publish a book and then expect a few royalties from those book sales. So you can see that with a single page, with a single page like this, um, using the business model canvas, any transpreneurs may have a preview of what the business is all about. And then it may also have um, an overview of the main difficulties, the main challenges that the business may, might have even before starting the business. So this is very important and very interesting too as far as strategic planning and strategic thinking is concerned. And this is also interesting because um, very few translators have been thinking about their business, the translation business this way. From, from a pilot study that I carried out a few uh, two years ago, I realized that when asked whether translators knew about entrepreneurship, almost 90% of them said they knew about entrepreneurship. And when they asked about when, uh, whether trans entrepreneurship would apply to translation, they said yes. And when they were asked whether they were considered themselves as entrepreneurs, so answers were quite different because some, some will say, yes, they consider themselves as entrepreneurs. Others will say, no, they, are, they don't consider themselves as entrepreneurs. And then some others would say to some extent, so they will be entrepreneurs to some extent. So it's quite interesting to bridge translation and entrepreneurship and using such tools like the business model canvas is always interesting and useful. Now, there are so many opportunities that entrepreneurs in Africa may, may benefit from. So these include for people specializing in technical translation, they may, they may, they may seize various opportunities links with um, the, the organizations of various um, events at lo local and regional events in Africa. So strategically, they may position their business as um, um, uh, a bis translation business that will be targeting event organizers in Africa. And by providing, by targeting those event organizers, they may, they may, they may um, go after those event organizers and then um, uh, suggest their services by saying, since you've been organizing international events, and then I know you'll be ad advertising your events using a website to an international audience, I could provide you with translation services to make sure that your message is clearer, is more impactful. And then I could also help translate the document, event documentation that, that will make it available in several languages. And by so doing, they will be contributing to knowledge sharing at local, regional, or global levels. Now, as far as literary translation is concerned, we may pay, take into consideration the fact that there's a lot of word literature works, literary, literary works that could be made available to African audiences, as well as there are so many African literature, lit, literature, uh, literature literary works, sorry, that could be made available to, to, to global audiences, to global readership. And transpreneurs may specialize in literary translations by paying attention to all those facts and then positioning their businesses in order to make more money from, or from these opportunities and seize those opportunities. There are also um, so many, so much work in Africa that is still um, kept in, in the oral, in the oral uh, form, oral format. Since Africa is, is more about oral literature, then trans transpreneurs may also position their, their businesses to provide main their, uh, transcription as their main services. 
they can also deal with language digitalizations or corpus linguistic corpus linguistics. Now, the the third area where transpreneurs may see many opportunities to cut a slice of the global translation cake is multimedia translation. And then this include providing their services to, uh, to streaming platforms like Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, and so on. By providing them with um, means to make those movies available into um, African languages, or by making sure that African productions are made available to global audiences. They can provide video dubbing or subtitling services. They can also provide website localizations to any businesses that will be interested in, in, in seizing opportunities in Africa or any African businesses that will be interested in, in getting access to wider markets. And then finally, there's a game localization area that is also interesting and that provides with people with many, many opportunities. And then as an example, let me show you um, in a trailer. So we we'll just listen. It's less than two minutes, and then I'll make a few comments after that. Okay, thank you very much for <clears throat> for listening to for watching this this short trailer. Actually, it's a it's a trailer for a video game that has been designed and implemented by an African company based in Cameroon, my con my my home country. And and you can see from the graphics that actually they they, they wanted to put Africa in the video in the game localization or the video the the, the gaming industry, the global gaming industry, because most of the time people have been um, people know about games that have been produced probably in Asia, like Japan or in the US, but people didn't believe that Africa could also make um, an interesting game like this one. So game designers focus on providing a game players with an opportunity to discover the African culture, discover, and you can see the African scenery, the African landscapes, the African music, and and even the superpowers are, um, are inspired by African tales. So you can see this is this is a quite an interesting product. And as entrepreneurs, uh, we can we can partner with uh, such game designers in order to provide them with either advice or consultancies or to to, to help them reach global global audiences and then make sure that actually at the end of the day. It is Africa that is that is gaining more visibility, and and everyone would be, would be happy. 
So this is another opportunity that's, that that um, transpreneurs could seize, when it, especially those one in Africa, because there are there are so many interesting projects like that, like this one that are being designed and implemented on a daily basis, but that are not uh, very, that many people are not sorry aware of. That many people are not aware of. So this was an example. Now, um, the saying goes that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I couldn't help but use this um, iceberg picture because I wanted to talk about the, um, the entrepreneurial success. So um, as entrepreneurs or as transpreneurs, um, whenever we succeed, it's always good so people will be sharing, people will be celebrating with us. But before getting into success, there are so many steps that people need to go through. And these include being prepared, um, thinking strategically and planning all our steps, failing, trying again, failing again, trying again, and getting some advice from friends, relatives and family. At times advice would be, just forget about this transition stuff. It's not a real job. Just quit it. Why can't you find a real job? And then, so, but if, if we are hardworking enough, we can succeed. And by the time we succeed, people will be seeing the success, but that will just be the tip of the, the aspect. And then there will be a larger part of the aspect that, that will keep, um, that will remain hidden. So this was, um, an image, a picture I, I couldn't help but use in order to illustrate this um, entrepreneurial uh, journey. So um, right now, as far as transpreneurs in Africa are concerned, I've come up with a three pillar approach to making sure that actually they can seize more and more opportunities and then trans African transpreneur would be more and more successful. And these three pillars are the first one is the planning. So government authorities are um, supposed to implement um, uh, conducive policies, good policies that will make language, business and transition environment conducive and allow more and more people to, to provide their services in the easier way, in, in the, fast, the faster way possible. Then once planning, the planning step is, is put in place, there's also the training pillar that is very important because um, uh, going through formal training as translators is something. Then we also need to keep keep up because the transition industry has, has been changing so fast. That is the reason why we also we should also carry out research and innovation um, projects and also involve get involved in lifelong training. And then the third pillar is support. No one could. Uh, succeed alone. So we are all in this together. So we should edify one another. We should seek some professional advice to, to seek assistance for professional association from trade unions or from third parties from any 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 sectors that we could, we could go uh, through. So these are the three pillars that could help uh, transpreneurs in Africa be, become more successful. Now, the, um, before rounding up this presentation, there are a few things that we should keep in mind. The first is that Africa plays a vital role in global economy. Never forget that. And even if you forgot, just remember that there are a few facts that you, you can overcome. And those facts and statistics are coming from the World Economic Forum. So I'm not the one saying it, but Africa plays a vital role in the global economy. So entrepreneurship is all about overcoming challenges. So even if you are facing difficulties right now, and if you are a transpreneur, remember that actually uh, you, you, should, you should be hardworking. You should keep on working hard in order to overcome your challenges because this is what entrepreneurship is all about. If you are afraid of challenges, then you should quit translating or you should quit being an entrepreneur. As simple as that. The third fact to, to remain to keep in mind is that African translators 
entrepreneurial capabilities should be built. This is something that I realized. And then I've been designing a few projects to make sure that actually I help a few colleagues, but it's just a starting point. So uh, I hope I will be more and more helpful as far as um, building entrepreneurial capabilities are concerned. The fourth point is the future of translation in Africa is bright. This is something I believe and I'm confident about it. And last but not the least, further research is needed as far as translation and entrepreneurship are concerned, whether in Africa or beyond. So this is, these are a few selected um, works, literature that you could um, find if you're interested about transpreneurs, about entrepreneurship, translator training, or translation as a profession. And this is the, the long form of the, the selected indicative bibliography. Now, before, before putting the final, the, the final dot, before concluding this, here is a, a proverb, an African proverb. He who is unable to dance says that the yard is Tony. So um, never find excuses. Keep on working, even if it's hard. I believe you can succeed as an entrepreneur because entrepreneurship is all about overcoming challenges. The last thing that I have to say is Malapke Motokwa, Depenu, Useko, Melesi, Asante. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let us now have a conversation in case you have questions or observations. Feel free to share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, that's fantastic. Um, if you want to maybe just stop sharing your screen now so we can facilitate the conversation a little better. And uh, I'm very happy to invite questions. Um, you're welcome to post them on the chat um, or you can just turn your mics on. It's a pretty small event tonight, so... Um, we can take them that way. So there's a question that's come in from Anna on the chat. Um, oh, I think that's just frozen now. Oh no, there we go. Um, so um, Carlos, if you want to have a look at the chat, you can see the questions there. If you just click on the chat button, um, I'll read them out, but it can be easy to follow them there as well. So Anna's asking, which would you say are the languages most in demand of translation professionals at present? in some areas of Africa at least, so acknowledging the 2000 languages, <laughs> obviously. So which are the languages oh. most in demand? Okay, so um, from, from this history of Africa, so Africa got in touch with Western languages through colonization. And that's the reason why um, there's still uh, so many people in Africa that's, that speak, uh, who speak um, French, English, uh, Spanish, Arabic, and depending on on the various areas, I believe in the in no, in northern Africa, so in the Maghreb area, uh, people would be most interested in speaking um, Arabic as the lingua franca. But I, but I, but I, but I know there are so many dialects of Arabic, and then there are so many other local languages that are there. Um, but speaking uh, or translating into or from Arabic. Would be would be very interesting for for professionals over there in northern Africa, but in Central Africa it will be French, English, and Spanish, along with along with local languages. So it depends on on the the, the, the domain whereby the translators want wants to, to 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 specialize in. But if it's like um, let's say if the UN is organizing a, a conference in Cameroon because Cameroon is in Central Africa, then they'll make sure at least this, their, their, their documentation is provided into English and French because those are the two official languages in Cameroon, English and French. And then, but on the other hand, if the, 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 the UN refugee agency, the UN refugee office is supposed to implement a, a community program Instead of speaking, instead of making sure that the documentation is provided into English and French, they might prioritize local languages. 
because people will be going into into the into the field and talking with people from time to time who, may, who might not have a good mastery of English and French, but they might use instead their their local languages. So it depends on uh, where they, they are because I know even in Eastern Africa there's uh, there's there, there's a, a, a quite a dominance of uh, local languages like uh, Kis Kinyaranda and Kiswahili. And so, so they are, they are, they are, they are local languages that have become more than uh, local languages that have become uh, regional languages, even like Lingala. There's a language like Lingala that is spoken in in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, in Congo, and some part of uh, Rwanda and Kenya. Yeah. So depending on on the, the goal and depending on the specializations, we might focus on Western languages or on African local languages. Thank you, Carlos. And there's a contribution from uh, Hanan yeah. Sharaf answering that question as well, for example, in Egypt. Yeah, mentioning Chinese as well, um, that's mm. booming and Korean, interesting. Can I can I just follow up um, and then and then Geraldine? Sorry, <laughs> I just got mine in before we. <laughs> uh, well, it follows on. It follows on from that question. So, um, w when I was in Burkina Faso not so long ago, um, colleagues there were talking about how if you are translated between French and English, you have sort of more prestige than if you're a translator um, working in local languages. Is that something that you sensed or found in your research, Carlos, that you've sort of got different money earning potential, maybe, depending on your language specialism? No, no once again, it depends on, on the, the business model. That's my point on it, because um, as, as you remember, I told you about um, Africa learning Western languages through colonization. So at a certain point in time, um, white people came in Africa and then they made pe African people believe that actually those, their languages were not up to the standards. They were not languages as per se. So um, many decades later, after the colonizations, people still have this um, complex about mm. speaking their own languages or making their languages inferior to Western languages. Mm. So that might be the case for some people. But as I said, in, 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 in Kenya or in Rwanda, I, I've, been, I've been to Ethiopia and then they've been using Am Amharic there mm. more than even English because I remember I was like at the airport and so many things were written in English and Amharic. And from time to time, people would speak to you directly in Amharic because they believe you understand the language. So the same thing might happen with uh, um, the Swahili in Kenya or Kenya Rwanda in Rwanda. But I, I, I believe as a, as a transpreneurs, we might, we might uh, define a, a specific strategy depending on the potential market, depending mm -hmm. on the segmentation that we decide mm -hmm. and depending on, on, on the potential clients that we want, want to reach to. And if those potential clients are, uh, for instance, uh, a Bible society, mm -hmm. You might not you might not uh, advertise your services to a Bible society by saying you will translate the Bible into French or into English. No, mm. they, they are they will be rather interested if you say you will be helping them into making the Word of God available to local populations. Therefore, mm. providing services, translation services from English or French into local languages. So it depends. It depends. Yeah, obviously, um, Africa is a vast continent as well, so it's. <laughs> it's not really, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a very varied answer, I guess, depending on, on where we're talking about. Um, Geraldine, would you like to go next? Oh, yes, thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for, for the talk and thank you very much for coining the term transpreneurs, which I think actually applies to many, many of the students who leave UCL and go on to work in the translation industry. And, and the question I wanted to ask you was what we, well, I noticed that your case study um, had uh, an M, a master's in translation, and I'd like to know what the uh, universities um, can do to support and bring on transpreneurs in Africa and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I believe um, 
if you remember during the presentation, I talked about the I talked about the um, the support the support pillar, the training and the support pillar. So uh, universities can can get involved as far as the uh, training is concerned, but they can also get involved as far as the support um, pillar is concerned. That is making sure that actually they provide the translators or would be translators with um, up to date training material with up to date. Um, with information about the trends, the latest trends in the translation industries, but most importantly, making sure that actually, apart from being trained as translators, that is content mediators, they should also be they, 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 they should also be some focus on business running, business starting, business practices, because um, I myself have been running a business for some time, but I'll, I'll to be honest, I would say. I still have so many shortcomings as far as financial management is concerned. I learn about my marketing uh, on, on the side. I learn about marketing on the side, but I, I haven't been taught about marketing. I, I've been taught about how to translate a text, how to do a discourse analysis. And, and from time to time, they, they, we've been taught about um, the first business model. That is whenever you, you, you graduate from a university with a translation uh, degree, you might set up, you might start your, 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 your freelance business. And then whenever you start the freelance business, you'll be providing your services through third parties, mainly using pros.com or Translators Cafe on other translator platforms. But this is not a viable business model. This is not a viable business model because uh, people have been complaining about uh, those platform advertising cheaper and cheaper um, uh, offers translators having difficulties in to, to earn a decent living out of their, their works because they're saying uh, sooner enough we've been we will be replaced by machines that will be translating automatically but these are all uh, um, let's say um, um, external factors that business business owners are supposed to be aware of remember um, uh, at first we were lighting houses using candles. But whenever they, 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 there was electricity, with the advent of electricity, people have to change. And then those people that, that were manufacturing candles have to reinvent their business models in order to stay in business. So normally this is all about providing would-be translators with the strategic thinking necessary to consider translation as a business and then to start behaving as a business owners, not just like translators will be spending their days translating, but apart from translating, they will be running businesses. And this include, this implies they will be behaving like business business owners. So, um, but but the universities can also partner with uh, professional association and trade unions. They can also make sure that from time to time, they will be inviting uh, professional translators. But apart from that, I, I guess universities have been doing that they would be inviting entrepreneurs from other areas just to share the experience, to share the failures, so that translators would um, get in some inspirations from the experiences because at the end of the day, they will all be entrepreneurs. I remember I attended the Paris Entrepreneur Show in 2018, and there were thousands of entrepreneurs over there from time to time after uh, when we're joining in networking sessions, they will talk about the experiences. They will say where, when they graduated from business, a business school or economics with a degree with, in economics, and they, they have started their own businesses in tech or ed tech or in fintech. And then they will ask, and you, I'll answer, oh, I'm, I'm a translator. And they'll say, oh, and that will be all. I could see from their faces that actually they were saying, what, what's going on? The man must have, I don't know, he, he, he were not supposed to be here. So because they didn't believe uh, translators could be entrepreneurs. And most of the time, even if you, you, you carry out a survey, you see the general public don't, see, don't take translators seriously most of the time. And even if you have to ask the general public about translators being viewed as entrepreneurs, they will say no. They are just people who sit with their pajamas all day long, and then they will be drinking coffee and then typing on their computers at home. That's all. But 
we need to change the narrative. We need to make sure that actually translators are trained in the good way as far as translation is concerned on the one hand, but as far as entrepreneurship practices is concerned on the other one. Thank you so much, Carlos, for that for that response. Um, uh, there's a bit of there's a bit of chat going on down the side, um, which uh, anyone who's um, involved in that is welcome to turn their mic on and uh, and just speak. There's a bit about taxation. There's a bit about China. <laughs> there's a bit about language policies. It's quite an interesting evening we're having here. Uh, we did start slightly late, so I think uh, we'll carry on until quarter two if people have an appetite for a little bit of further discussion. I don't want to cut us too short. Um, would anyone like to pick up on anything in that chat? Just turn your mic on and speak, please. Um, actually, can I ask a follow-up question to what you just said, Carlos, about yeah. um, changing the narrative about trans about translators? I thought that was really interesting, and you know, they're not sitting in their pajamas drinking coffee, which is definitely an impression that I think they give and actually that they that people are still giving about themselves if you look at translators who write about themselves on Twitter that's often what they're sort of projecting mm -hmm. how can how we should change the narrative how can we change a narrative and going back to my question what can universities do to mm -hmm. change the narrative well um I, I was when I was at, um, doing my translation masters I was really impressed by a book by Lawrence Venuti called The Translator's Invisibility. And I, I'm sure many of us know about this book. And later on, I, I wondered why is it that translators should be invisible? Why? So I've been thinking about it. So I started um, testing a program called The, Tran the Visible Translator. I tested a program and then I wrote a, a, a blog post that received an award on pro, uh, the community choice award at post.com. It was all about the translator's visibility, how to be visible as a translator. So changing the narrative would start by making our profession more prestigious because the general public think about translation as being something automatic. And I'm sure many of our colleagues have been asked how do you translate this word into these languages? Don't you speak Chinese? Don't you speak uh, Japanese? I remember people have been asking me whether I speak Chinese. I said, no. And they'll say, which type of uh, translator are you? I thought translators could translate into all, every languages in the world. So the general public is not aware about things that we do, about the impact that we have. And I believe we could start changing the narrative by making our profession more prestigious because most of the time, and that's that's something I also notice. Even trans, transition schools advertise the program by saying, whenever you graduate, you could work at the UN, you could work like um, at the European Commission. And but what about those translators who may not find a job at the UN, or they'll be working as freelance translators and. They will, that, that's the vast majority of translators working as freelance translators. Since they are working from their home offices, they are not in contact with the general public. So the general public believe, uh, they just hear about translation and then they have their own fantasies about translation. So it's high time we, we may help enhance the translator's visibility, making it more visible that translators are vital key players in in making the world a, a, a good place or a better place. For instance, whenever I was young, uh, I, I was I, I used to enjoy watching movie. And one of my 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 earlier movies that I've enjoyed include movies from uh, in, uh, featuring uh, U.S. actors like Tom Cruise or Jackie Chan. So I would watch the movie in French, and I was convinced at the time that actually those actors were speaking in French. But until uh, later, I, I, but I, I didn't realize that actually they were speaking in language, in the case of Tom Cruise or uh, Jackie Chan would be speaking maybe in Chinese. And then they are, they are, they, the movie was made, was made available to me as, as, as someone watching it in Africa through the work of translators. 
But I guess those people that were in, involved into the project uh, have not been given uh, the visibility that they deserve. From time to time, we may be uh, letting maybe the, the mainstream media know about the role that translation could play in audiovisual, uh, in the, the audiovisual area, in gaming, in literature, in in so many things in the world, so in world in the world economics and so on and so forth. So I guess universities universities could partner with the media, with partner with social uh, um, professional associations, with with um, trade unions, and by making the translators more and more visible, I guess the general public could start believing that this they are doing some great job, they are doing something interesting, they are doing something important for for, for the world. Thank and you. they could start changing the, the perception about translation and translators. Thank you. We 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 um we have a hand up, Hanan Sharaf. Um, would you like to go next? Uh, okay, I just want to add uh, to what Carlos said. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank him for the this very interesting uh, presentation. It's real eye opening. Uh, uh, I have some experience uh, in introducing entrepreneurship in my classes. I teach at uh, Mr. International University at the Faculty of Languages and for two semesters now, uh, through the course of uh, translation of documents, we are trying to introduce the students to uh, the, 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 the world of entrepreneurship. So the, the project that the, the students are working on throughout the semester is building up the their own uh, translation agency, making a website to uh, publicize their agency and creating a business model. I believe I can make use of uh, the uh, example that Carlos uh, gave us today about the, the business model. So they uh, search the market, they try to find uh, a place where they can uh, initiate their agency. How can they save money? Would they make it an online agency or they will have a physical uh, location for it or not. Uh, they uh, try to uh, search for the rates, the, the common rates uh, given to translators in Egypt and uh, if they are going to buy uh, computers, if they are going to buy licenses for uh, CAD tools, which CAD tool to choose and uh, which is best for their business model and how will they finance buying these licenses or will they opt for a free uh, online CAD tool uh, as a starter, how will they uh, propagate for their business and how will they reach their clients? We teach them to make the the, the documents that they will need, uh, uh, something like the uh, contract that they will have with their clients, the client obligations, the company obligations, and so on. And uh, it, it is really success because students, for the first time, they find that can we do this can we after just after graduation can we go and open our own business and ha have our own business not waiting for somebody to hire us or for for a company to give us an opportunity to work for them and i believe uh, this is the role of universities in the coming years is to guide their students and help them to see the opportunities they are missing or to change their mindset even from just waiting for an opportunity to come their way or somebody offering them a job to creating their own presence in the market. But I just wanted to add this to what Carlos have, uh, said before. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and that's, that's a really um, that's a really great contribution. Um, I think what I'm going to do, because it's already quarter to nine and we've slightly overrun, but if we were, you know, in person, um, once it ended, we wouldn't all be immediately turfed out of the room and we could probably circulate and go down to the front and chat to Carlos and, and all of this nice stuff and then go and have a glass of wine. So obviously the wine I can't do anything about, but the the sort of the, the slow chat um, to finish, if people want to carry on with that, I think we'll do that. So I'll bring things formally to a close, but um, I won't close down the uh, the Zoom until people have uh, have definitely sort of are definitely ready to go. Um, so um, thank you, thank you very much, Carlos, for a really stimulating talk. I can see it's got uh, Geraldine and, and 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 me thinking about okay, what are we, what are we going to do at UCL now? And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and thank you to to others for their contributions. Thank you to those who've uh, asked questions and and spoken and thank you for everyone who's 
posted on the chat. Uh, it's been some really interesting discussion going on there and do feel free to continue it uh, for a moment now if you'd like. Um, so uh, th thanks very much, Carlos, for that contribution. And um, we really wish you all the best as you, as you carry on with your PhD and, and go on to do many other great things, I'm sure. Um, just a quick advert now. So the next event in this series is going to be hosted by SOAS on Thursday, the 10th of December at 1 p.m. That is um, a freelance <laughs> anime and manga translator, uh, Jake Chung. Uh, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce his name. Um, so that, that's, a, that's an example of a, a transpreneur, I guess, in action. Yeah. And then uh, the next one that we're hosting is going to be on the 26th of January. And that is um, our other Cameroon colleague, uh, Dr. Stephanie uh, Engola from the University of Yaoundé. Uh, and she's going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the African translation market. So I think that makes a very, a very nice compliment to this talk that we've just had. Um, you're also very welcome to attend any of the talks in our other series, uh, which is on translation and technology. Uh, the next one of those will be on Monday, the 7th of December. And that's entitled, Are the Algorithms Taking Over AI and Language? And that's by two UCL colleagues, uh, Emre Kazim and Adriano Koshiyama. So you're very welcome to all of that. Um, it's on our website if you want to have a look and, uh, and if you want to register as well. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, here's my round of applause. Okay. Thanks for having me on the programme. <laughs> Thank you. Are you all right, Carlos, just to hang around as people leave the room, maybe drift towards yeah, you for a chat or towards not. each other? I don't know if that will happen or not. Everybody might just go off and sip their coffee in their pyjamas. But um, thank you. It's been a really fun evening. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> I myself, I enjoy it too. Brilliant. Thanks. <laughs> I swear I need to play music as well. Yeah, African music. Yeah. <laughs> I can see another face there. Ser Serin Ndiaye. Is that a Senegalese name? Yes, I'm from Senegal. And I'm sorry I did not join uh, the webinar at the right time. Oh, don't worry. It's so confusing. Uh, yeah, with all the time. But, but it was interesting. Thank you, Carlos, for your brilliant presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too, for joining us. Right. Are you from um, Gaston Berger? Now from UCAD, but I was in Boya for the training. Oh, oh in Cameroon. Asti. Asti. That's Asti, where I've been yes. trained. Yeah, that's where I've been trained. Wow. Oh, that's nice. Mm. Can maybe I if I can have your email address or Carlos? Uh, let, let me just write let me just write it here. Oh, all right. So, so, Catherine, are we going to receive notification for the other events? Um, not automatically, no. You'll need to go on our website and then register for them. And register. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I see. I, I haven't, um, I, I'm not sort of keeping an email trail of who's signed up for the individual events. So if, if you're interested in the other ones, if you could just go on our website and then each one's got its own registration oh, right. link. I yeah. Oh, oh, all right, I will do that. Thank you very That's much. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's great. Oh, yeah, thanks, Carlos, for your email address there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. I think most people have, uh, have headed off now. All right. Um, Umaru, yes. I can see you there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I remember we met in 2013 in Liège and we shared a lot of uh, fun there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a great, that was a great conference. Although I, re I remember I was quite ill, actually. I had a really horrible, um, uh, just a flu type thing. <laughs> and I didn't feel good at all. We didn't but, see uh, it. Uh, we didn't realize. It. We didn't realize, but um, that was the one where Jean René Ladmirail was there as well, right? And he, yeah, yeah, he's he's very old school, so he kept when he knew I was <laughs> ill, he kept putting like he had a little a little hip flask with like whiskey in or something like this, and oh, he kept God. putting it in my coffee. His like medicine. He's oh, like, come God. on, Catherine, you'll feel better. <laughs> 